As we planned the program, we didn't want it to be just another pro-con debate about gun controls. Not that there's anything wrong with having that debate. But for this, I was aiming for, pun intended, a more thoughtful conversation about why we, uh, as Americans, have this obsession with guns, and apparently have had since colonial days. I understand at some level what guns mean in America. Uh, I grew up learning to shoot uh, a single shot 22 rifle on my dad's farm in Texas. And I qualified on the gun range in boot camp for the Navy. And I'm very familiar with the Second Amendment, got guarantee uh, of the right to own guns and the debate that centers on exactly what that amendment means. But I suspected there was more to it than just arguing about legal interpretations of the Constitution's meaning. I'm not going to take too long here. We're going to get started. When David first called me, uh, I immediately thought of Bob Costas. I don't know if many of you all remember his comments in December right before the Sandy Hook tragedy when uh, Yvonne Belcher, the NFL player, had shot himself, his, his girlfriend, and then himself. And he evoked on air on Saturday, Sunday night, uh, we need to have a conversation about gun culture. And that's what I see us doing here tonight. We're not here to talk about specific tragedies. Um, we're here to explore how and why we as a nation are so unique in the Western world and how we might bridge the divide between those of us who like guns and those of us who do not. So let's get to it. I'm going to ask Dan to come up first, uh, and he'll start off, and then we'll hear from each of the panel, and then we'll start having a conversation, and then uh, we'll ask you to join in later. Thanks. Good evening. My name is Dan Baum. I am a weirdo in that I am a liberal Democrat Jewish guy from New Jersey who is also a lifelong gun guy. And so for my whole life, I have been kind of like a closeted gay man because when I'm around my tribe of liberal Democrats, they will just say the most god-awful things about gun owners and gun people, and I would just kind of keep my mouth shut and chuckle along. And then when I go to gun stores or gun ranges, you know, they would say just the most god-awful things about Obama and the Democrats and the liberals, and I would just keep my mouth shut. So um, I have spent my life kind of divided this way wondering a couple of things. One is, why is a fondness for firearms often found on the same chromosome as political conservatism? I never understood it, because I don't feel it myself, not being a conservative. And also, what is it about firearms that I like so much, that my fellow gun guys like so much? Why do they move us who like guns so deeply? I mean, it's not like golfers are as passionate about golf clubs as we gun guys are about guns. And so I've wondered, what is that? And right after President Obama was elected the first time, I decided I'm going to go find out. And I got in my car, and I drove 15,000 miles around the United States, determined just to talk to gun people, just to listen. Because it seemed to me that the Democrats and the, the gun control people, on, one, on the one hand, we're making a lot of assumptions about gun owners that I knew were not true. At least they were not true for me. And then the NRA on the other side was making a lot of assumptions about gun owners that I didn't think was true, at least not for me. You've got to remember there's 100 million gun owners in America, and there's only 4 million members of the NRA. So even accounting for gun owners who support the NRA without actually paying dues, we're still talking about a minority. So it seemed to me that the one thing that nobody was doing was actually listening to gun owners and spending time with them and asking, why are firearms important to you? How do they fit into your life? Why are we so passionate about these things? Now, I realized if I got in my car and started going around to places like Kentucky and Montana and Wyoming and asking people about their gun lives, they were going to look at me and freeze me out because I look like a middle-aged Jewish man from New Jersey. So I held my nose, and I joined the NRA to get a nice little blue and gold NRA cap, and I put it on my head, and I realized, well, now I look like a middle-aged Jewish man from New Jersey wearing an NRA cap, and that wasn't going to work. So I realized nothing says gun guy like a gun. 
So I got a concealed carry permit, um, which was easy, thanks to y'all here in Florida, which started the concealed carry revolution in 1987. And I wore a gun everywhere I went, wore a gun for a year and a half, um, in part to um, endear myself to the people I was talking to. I wore a cool old Colt revolver that you can't get a holster for anymore, so I'd always say, you know, I'm looking for a holster for this old Colt. And suddenly I was one of them, and, um, uh, but also um, it got me into the gun guy head, and I can tell you uh, from experience, I don't know how many of you carry, um, when you wear a gun, the world looks completely different than when you're not wearing a gun, and that was very educational to me. Now, a lot of the attraction to firearms I could have guessed at before I left. I mean, I knew they're fun. If you like them, they're just a lot of fun. And there's a kind of a zen to shooting, and it's, it's, it's a fun thing to do. I knew they were mechanically beautiful. Um, the guns I own are mostly old, so I knew that guns, there's a lot of history involved in guns, and guns are associated with the most dramatic moments in our history, so I knew that was a part of it. I know there's a lot of family heritage to guns. They last forever, so they get handed down. So I knew that, but there were a couple of things that I didn't know that really made an impression on me, and I'd like to share those with you because I think they point us perhaps to um, some solutions, actually. Um, the first that I wasn't really prepared for was to own firearms is for many gun guys. When I say gun guys, I mean men and women, although 90% of the people who own guns and shoot guns are men. So gun, I'll use gun guys as shorthand. But for, for gun guys, owning a firearm, there's a lot of self-esteem in it. And when I say that, a lot of people um, misinterpret that. They make penis jokes and whatnot. And that's not what I'm talking about. And, and, or they say, oh, yeah, you own a gun so you can, you can blow somebody away. And in fact, it's really the opposite, and it's a subtle thing, and I, and I really want you to hear this. To own firearms and to um, teach people how to use them, perhaps to carry them, to hunt, to shoot, to become good with them, takes a tremendous amount of discipline, and it takes a tremendous amount of thought and skill, and gun guys are proud of that. They're proud of it the way racing car drivers are. I mean, they're using these incredibly dangerous things, and they're living alongside them, and they're, nobody around them is getting hurt. Maybe they're teaching children to use them. And that means something to them. And it turns out that if you look at the industry figures, the bulge of the gun guy demographic, by no means the whole thing, but kind of the centerpiece of the gun guy demographic, is middle-aged white men who did not finish college. And that is a demographic that has been beaten up in this country in the last 30 years. These are guys who, in many cases, really don't have much else that, they, that makes them feel good. And, but owning guns does. And another thing that makes them feel good, for which I was not prepared, is there is a patriotic element to, to owning firearms. Um, and even some of these guys who are not well educated could be quite eloquent on this subject. And they would say to me, you know, Part of what, in, in so many words, they would say, in, part of what makes the United States unique is the tremendous amount of trust that is placed in we the people. And we who are journalists understand this because we all are amazed at how much freedom we have as journalists to, to publish, to demand information from our government, to speak, to broadcast. Um, we are trusted in this country. And part of what we are trusted with in this country is owning firearms. This really came to me strongly when I was at a machine gun shoot in the Arizona desert. Yes, we can own machine guns. You have to jump through a few hoops. But I'm out in the desert with these guys, maybe 300 guys, with the most unbelievable firepower you can imagine. I mean, they're all very rich because machine guns are very expensive. And they're going through $10,000 worth of ammunition in a weekend. And these tremendous guns on tripods and anti-aircraft guns. And I'm looking at this and thinking, what a country that we are permitted to own this stuff, take it out on a weekend and play with it. There's no official supervision there. There's, you know. Um, now, we can argue about whether this trust to own firearms is misplaced. And, and that's, a, that's a good discussion to have. But the fact is, we are trusted to own guns to a much greater degree than in 
many other countries. And to gun guys, that's really important. I had one of them say to me, you know, I feel like a bit player in American history just by being a gun owner. So this is powerful stuff. Right after my book came out, I got invited to the White House to brief Joe Biden on how gun guys think. And as I was being, it was a big thrill. And as I'm being let in, I asked the, the staff person, how much time do I have? And she said, well, you're on the ca calendar for, you're on the schedule for 45 minutes, though this is Joe Biden. How much time you get to talk is, you know, be a question. And of course, I'm a big Joe Biden fan. I've been a big Joe Biden fan my whole life. It was a real thrill. But you know, Joe Biden, he wants to talk. So I got maybe, I was actually with him for about an hour and a half. I got about 10 minutes of talking time in. But um, I tried to impress upon him that when you talk about guns and when you talk about limiting access to this or that gun, what gun guys hear is not you going after the guns. What they hear is you're coming after me. You don't like me. You are, and, and so this is not, um, this is serious business. And, it's, and, it, and, and gun guys hear this debate on a different level than non-gun people do. For a lot of non-gun people, it's about the guns. But for the gun guys, it's about them. And it's about who they are. And th it's powerful. And, and so the tragedy, I think, especially after Sandy Hook, um, is that we've got, these, we've got this silly debate that satisfies nobody. We get nowhere with it. Um, the, the gun guys aren't happy with it, and the non-gun, the, 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 the people who want to limit guns or, or in favor of gun control, they're not happy with it either, because of course they got their heads handed to them in this last one. Um, and I have a piece in Harper's this month that just came out and I actually think there is a way forward out of this, but it's going to require a really painful readjustment for both sides. And what it, what it involves is something that's really kind of out of fashion nowadays, and that is respect uh, and showing respect. Um, I believe, and I'm a big Obama fan, I'm a big Joe Biden fan, I am a lifelong Democrat, I'm a diehard Democrat, but I think the Democrats chose this fight badly last, this, this last time, fought it badly, got their heads handed to them, and I think they made us a lot less safe. Because gun guy or not, whether you are Wayne LaPierre or Sarah Brady, one thing we all agree on is we all want fewer people to get shot. We all want to be safer. And there are things that both sides, I think, need to accept that would be very painful. But if they did, and if we could somehow lower the temperature on this debate and stop calling each other names, all right, we've got to stop calling liberals gun grabbers, and we've got to stop calling them liberals, right? And we've got to stop calling the other side gun nuts, and we've got to stop writing editorials that blame gun culture for Sandy Hook, because when you do that, I was just on MSNBC with Chris Hayes, and he was going on and on and on about gun culture. It was after that little girl in Kentucky was shot by her little brother. And he did about a 10 minute rant about how the, the, the culprit here is gun culture. And what I tried to explain to him is, my brother, you know, when you say gun, when you blame gun culture, you're telling 100 million people in this country that they're to blame. I mean, gun guys hear that and say, wait a minute, I'm gun culture. I mean. I'm a big MSNBC fan. I'm a liberal Democrat. And I was irritated by being blamed by pro in proxy. I said to him, you know, it's like blaming gays, gay culture for AIDS. I mean, this was a tragedy, right? It is not the culture's fault. It, you know, anyway, I was trying to explain to him he, he's not helping. Um, I would argue to those who want to control guns, who want to ban guns in the future, that may have been a good conversation to have a hundred years ago, but it's too late. Right now, we have 300 million guns about in circulation in the United States. To me, the goal should be, how do we live more safely among all those guns? That's a lot of guns. And they're out there, they're not going away, they never wear out. Um, the gun I hunt with was made in 1900. It's one of the attractions of guns, they don't wear out. 
So we have all these guns out there. So when you talk about banning guns, this gun or that gun, the purchase for these guns in the future, you're nibbling at the edges. The question should be, how do we live more safely among all these guns? And I think the answer is, we enlist the gun guys. We make friends with the gun guys. And when I say this to people who don't like guns, the, the hair on the back of their neck stands up. But look, the gun guys own the guns. They are the custodians of our national civilian arsenal. They decide who gets their hands on guns. They decide if a child can get his hands on a gun, if a depressed teenager can get his hands on a gun, if a criminal can get his hands on a gun. It's up to them. And I got to say to my fellow gun guys, my brothers, we are criminally lousy stewards of this national civilian arsenal. We are terrible at this. We leave our guns in the nightstand. We leave our guns in the glove compartment of the car. We leave them in the closet. And the wrong people are getting their hands on them. And we really have to flip the script on this. Gun policy has always been based on the idea that gun guys are a problem that need to be managed, that need to be squeezed down into ever smaller boxes. We got to flip this and say, no, gun guys are an asset. They are our allies in the fight against gun violence because it is up to them who is actually going to get their hands on the guns. We can pass laws all day long about what goes on in gun stores, about what guns people can buy. Too late. Too late. Because the killing is done with these guns that have been around forever. So when Chris Hayes and when the editorial board of the New York Times and when the, when the vice president and the president are talking about banning this or that gun and pushing the buttons of the gun guys, they are doing exactly the wrong thing. They are making enemies of them. And I would argue we need to make friends with them. We need to make allies of them. Perhaps, you know, uh, and my fellow gun guys, we got we to grow up. I mean, if any of you are gun people and you have a gun that is either not, it's, your gun should be in one of two places. It should be on your hip or it should be locked in a safe. And if we would do that, if we would get serious about that, no kids would shoot, would shoot their little sisters. No depressed teenagers would get their hands on guns and shoot themselves or shoot up their high school. Bad guys would not be coming in our houses and getting our guns and going and doing bad things with them. It is up to us. It is up to the gun community to do this. And my big argument with the NRA, and I'm pretty tough on the NRA in my book, is that the NRA is stuck on gun rights. They're stuck on the Second Amendment. I'm not a Second Amendment guy. I'm not going to argue about the Second Amendment tonight. But we got to get past that. We got to talk about our responsibilities. We are in charge of the country's guns. It is up to us to make the country safer. And I haven't heard the NRA talk about responsibility in 50 years, um, not since I was in summer camp. Right, getting a little NRA patch for shooting a 22 rifle. NRA used to talk about responsibility all the time, and they don't anymore. They are stuck on the gun rights argument. It's all about their rights. The, the argument begins and ends with their rights. And I think that's really wrong. I think it's really tragic for the country. And on the, and the other side doesn't, doesn't help them get off that because the other side is constantly goading them. So both sides need to calm down lower the temperature of their rhetoric, and think about how do we make the country safer. Um, I have long thought that it would be an act of genius for a Democratic president to say the, 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 the rate of gun violence in this country has been falling for 20 years. It's half of what it was 20 years ago. It's a huge success. It's actually a success you don't hear much about because neither side wants you to know that because both sides use the specter of rising crime and rising violence to its own political advantage. But in fact, gun, gun, in most parts of the country nationally, gun crime, violent crime is half of what it was 20 years ago. It's falling. And, and a smart Democrat would say, I charge the NRA with continuing this tra trend. Nobody knows guns better than the NRA, so it's up to you. Keep the, keep the rate of violence falling. Keep the rate of shootings falling. And we will introduce no new gun control laws. I think we, the gun guys, can do this. I actually argued in the Wall Street Journal, this is the kind of editorial they love. I said government could get out of this altogether. 
if we gun guys were to create a culture in which it is just unforgivable to leave your guns unsecured. I mean, that sounds like a pretty simple thing. Some states have laws. You have to have a gun in a safe. And if, if your gun is stolen and something bad happens with it, you're liable. I think those are good laws. I think we gun guys have proven we're not good enough yet at taking care of the nation's civilian arsenal to, um, to, to, to not be punished for, for violating this fundamental rule of maintaining control of our guns. So that's my little rap. And, and it came from talking to gun guys all over the country and hearing that guns mean, mean something to them way deeper than is commonly discussed in this, what passes for a debate in our country, and that there is a way forward out of these tragedies that we could all live with if each side would show the other a great deal more respect. So that's, that, that's, my, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right, well, hi, everybody. I'm Al Tompkins from the Pointer Institute. I'm a journalist. <laughs> Don't hold that against me. Um, before I, uh, I get started, I want to say uh, thank you to a couple of people. The first person I want to say thank you to is my rabbi out here, uh, my gun rabbi, Ted uh, Eastbrook, from Ted's Gun Supply, uh, who about, I don't know, when's that been? About six months ago. I called him out of the blue and said, I'd like to do something about training journalists to cover guns more smartly. And I thought he was going to, uh, first of all, he didn't believe me. I think he thought it was a setup. But he invited me to come over to his shop. Throw your hand up just for a second, Ted. This guy knows guns, and he's not paying me to do this. I haven't seen him in months. Uh, but this guy knows guns. And my suggestion, my strong suggestion to you is if you want to know something about guns, I mean really know something about guns, go see him. Uh, take one of his classes, uh, whether you ever intend to buy one or not. Uh, that would make you a lot smarter, because this guy knows his stuff. Um, not long after... Um, not long after the uh, Sandy Hook shootings, he called me and he said, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to, for anybody that wants to sell a gun, I'd like to handle the permitting. for the, I'll, I'll handle the transaction. I'll do a background check. Heck with all this flea market gun sale stuff. I'll handle it. Um, and he couldn't get any press for it. I thought that was a really good story. And he couldn't get any journalist involved, uh, interested in the story. Um, to my knowledge, nobody's still done the story. Here's a guy who had a solution of no cost, low cost solution to what everybody was trying to legislate around, and he couldn't get any attention for it. Um, so, shout out to Ted and to uh, guys like him who are really good gun owners and really good guys and really smart about guns, no matter how you feel about guns. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say before I start uh, spouting off is I recognize that I have the sheriff over here who really. Uh, does face guns. He and his guys face guns. And so while it's safe for a guy like me to sit in my office and spout off about all the things I think I know about guns, the fact of the matter is he actually faces them and his guys actually face them and his gals actually face them. And I'd like to thank him in front of everybody uh, for keeping us uh, uh, as safe as they do every day. So thank you for what you guys do. Let's keep things in perspective. How would you like to walk up on some car in the middle of the night not knowing what's in there? I mean, just think about it. To walk, as you walk to your car tonight, imagine just for a second you're him doing that, and you don't know what's sitting inside. Uh, I have played that game with my head several times. I don't want to do it, but I'm, uh, but I'm in awe of guys like him who do. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is uh, the difference between gun facts and gun truths. Remember, I'm a journalist. Uh, and I teach journalists. Uh, and I got on this jag a couple of years ago about complaining that journalists don't do a very good job covering the gun issue. They don't do a very good job covering the gun control issue, and they don't do a very good job speaking for guys like Ted, uh, who are responsible gun owners. And so I really wanted to do something about training journalists to do a better job. Uh, I need to throw my cards on the table. I am a gun owner. It is in my safe. Um, and uh, I've been a gun owner my whole life. Uh, I grew up in rural Kentucky in a place where they had 410 shotguns in our gym class. So uh, we had guns in school and you had to shoot them in order to pass gym class. So that was uh, the way I grew up. 
Uh, Teddy Ro by the way, it was great Teddy Roosevelt background. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt suggested in 1902 that every public school ought to have a shooting range so that we become better shots and can better defend the country. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm always interested in the fact that through the years, through the centuries actually in the United States, we have repeatedly uh, addressed issues of guns and never very successfully. Most of you probably don't know that the machine gun law that uh, you just heard about actually uh, came up after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt wanted to do something about machine gun deaths. They couldn't uh, outlaw them because they felt it was a Second Amendment issue. So instead they slapped an enormous tax on them. Um, and uh, so the fact of the matter is, is this has come up over and over and over again. The first real address about gun rights um, first of all, the, the state of Kentucky and later the state of uh, Louisiana, I think it was, uh, tried to outlaw handguns, and of course they couldn't, um, and that was in the 1800s. Uh, in uh, 1897, I wrote it down, 1896, you might remember a decision called Plessy versus Ferguson, a United States Supreme Court case. Plessy versus Ferguson was actually a, 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 a uh, what we think of now as sort of a civil rights issue. It had to do with property ownership. But the court specifically mentioned gun ownership. So I'm speaking in front of a judge here. Uh, judge, uh, um, uh, stop me if I get, uh, I'm, I don't want to practice law without a license here, but um, uh, they specifically mentioned in Plessy versus Ferguson gun ownership as being an example of what all people in the United States should be able to own, including um, uh, black Americans at that time who still didn't have their full civil rights, but even the Supreme Court in the late 1800s decided that gun rights was in fact part of property rights. So this has been a repeat kind of uh, theme throughout the last centuries in the United States. Let me walk through a couple of things that I hope will uh, be interesting to you. These are some of the things I've talked with journalists about as we've done some training for them. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that this is a Gallup poll uh, data over time starting in 1960 to the left and uh, uh, 2012 to the right. And uh, you'll be interested, aren't you, to find that gun ownership is fairly steady as a percentage of households. Do you have a gun in your home has been the consistent question they've asked. Uh, and pretty consistently the number has been uh, somewhere between 50 and 43 percent, sometimes lower, sometimes higher. Uh, the number that you see, the little spike that you see there, um, was around the time that the assault weapons, the first assault weapons ban was passed, um, and there was a spike upwards, as Ted would tell you, every time there's some uh, conversation about, uh, uh, about banning something or another, there's always a big increase in sales uh, in both ammo and weapons. Um, so as you can see, there have been highs and there have been lows, but uh, the, the number really doesn't fluctuate that enough. Let me just say that there are reasons that you can't believe the stats I just gave you. You should always be skeptical of these kinds of stats. Why? Because gun owners may be reluctant uh, to even talk about whether or not they own guns. Uh, they are quite fearful, in fact, that they'll be targets of burglars uh, and so on. Uh, women, for example, who are um, gun owners because of domestic violent threats may not uh, respond. And of course, gun owners distrust pollsters in a big way. Who are you to call me and ask me whether or not I've got guns? And so uh, the suspicion is, is that probably gun owners under-report to pollsters their gun ownership. Pollsters ask different questions. And so the problem is, over time, as we try to track gun ownership, we sometimes end up with inconsistent gun owner records because the questions keep changing. For example, look at this chart. This is four different surveys about gun ownership in the United States. A general social survey, Gallup is the, is the purple color. Pew Research uh, is the uh, green one. And then ABC News and Washington Post started polling on this in 1997. But what you'll see is a wildly different report. For example, um, uh, look at this. Uh, you can see that Pew Research shows that gun ownership is around 33, 34%. But other surveys show it to be almost 10% more than that. That's a big gap. That's a third different, right? So there's a big gap even in reputable polling as to gun ownership. And that's why you should be really skeptical of numbers. We don't know within 40, 40 million probably uh, how many guns are owned in the United States. I mean, not even within about 40 million. Those numbers fluctuate so wildly. 
I thought you'd enjoy this one. This is um, a list of developed countries around the country. I could show you undeveloped countries. We'd still be at the right of the chart. The United States gun ownership, this is a number of guns per 100 people. Um, and as you can see, the red bar is the United States. There's Japan, which has very restrictive gun control laws. There's Great Britain, uh, which only relatively recently put big restrictions on gun ownership. Uh, and then uh, over here, you see a couple of anomalies. Uh, Finland, um, uh, as an example, is uh, a pretty big gun ownership country. A lot of machine guns in Finland, and I've never talked to any of my Finnish students to figure out why that is. Uh, their gun violence rate isn't all that high, but their gun ownership rate is, but it's still around half of the United States. Who owns guns? I thought you'd be interested in this. This is Pew in the Press. Uh, first of all, men, of course, uh, uh, more than women, although almost a third of women uh, say that they are in households with guns. Uh, this is uh, by far the biggest percentage of uh, gun owners are men uh, who are 50 to 64, a fairly widely represented demographic in this audience. In fact, you're a pretty good snapshot of gun owners. Um, white, more than black, uh, about two to one. Does that surprise you? No? OK. Uh, and some college. Um, Dan called them, uh, did you call them college dropouts? Is that what you call them? That, that, I think it oh, didn't finish college. That's different. I suppose it's different than college dropout. Um, so some college, uh, although college grads are still 40% of college grads, 40% of gun owners are college grads. Um, the South, obviously, is um, overrepresented compared to other parts. It shouldn't surprise you. Rural, more than urban, think about that number, about 55% rural. That's an interesting number because it may speak a lot to why they own guns. Um, and married, more than not married. I don't know about you, that number kind of surprised me. Does that surprise you? Yes, no, yes? Judge, does that surprise you? No, it doesn't surprise him at all. <laughs> Wouldn't you just love to spend a day in his courtroom, boy? What a parade that would be. The number of gunshots, uh, the, the cost of gunshots, it's a stunning number. Uh, the number is, what was it, $153.3 billion, the cost of gunshots. I can't even get my head around a number like that. But let's look at this number. We often talk about gun legislation as a reaction to mass killings in the United States. And it often seems like mass killings are getting more common, but the fact of the matter is mass killings in the United States are about consistent year to year to year. I don't know why it seems like there are more. Because of cable news, but cable news would outstretch this, um, would outstretch this, this uh, graphic by a, by a number of years, by a decade. Um, so, uh, it seems like there's a lot more than there is, but the fact is the number is relatively consistent. The number of people who are killed in mass killings, relatively consistent. Mass killings are, are four and more, according to uh, the Justice Department statistics. Causes of death. I want to spend just a minute on this because it's really telling. If you watch the news, if you listen to the news, you would think that the number one cause of death is firearms, but in fact, Gun deaths are not even close to the number one cause of death, not even close to the number two cause of death or the number five cause of death. The number one cause of death for whites in the United States is heart disease. Number two, cancer. That's about half of all the deaths. For blacks, it's close to half but less because you also have to factor in stroke for blacks, which is a significant cause of death. But once you start looking at these two charts, these charts are based on Centers for Disease Control fatality reports. If you want to do some light reading, uh, you, can, uh, you can go look at CDC um, uh, data and pull this up. But unintentional injuries, Alzheimer's and pneumonia and so on, suicide, suicide for whites kills far more people than homicide, far more. We should be holding a new a conference on suicide. Let me tell you, we live in the elder suicide capital of America, Pinellas County. 
Uh, over on blacks, uh, you see that number. Uh, what's different there is that um, unintentional injuries are 4.2 percent, which is a, um, a pretty high number, and then HIV creeps in. And then you have a lot of others. Just so we can be complete, you can see American Indian, Asians, Hispanics. In no case is gun deaths anywhere approaching the number one cause or the number five cause or the number six cause of death. Not even close. Not even close. And I want you to keep this in mind as you watch the news and as you listen to all the conversations in Congress about gun control because they're solving a problem that's a relatively small problem, statistically speaking. Now again, I'm not the sheriff. I'm not the one walking up on this. It's easy for me to throw numbers up and minimize the problem. But statistically speaking, it's a relatively small number compared to these other causes of death. In raw numbers, you can see them. Influenza claims far more lives than guns in the United States. CDC's vital statistics, I just wanted you to see this. Assault by homicide is the 18th leading cause of death. And that's not necessarily all guns. Um, you can see that it um, compares then to suicide, which is among whites the 10th leading cause of death and among blacks the 16th leading cause of death. Since we had the tornadoes in Oklahoma, I thought you'd like to see the odds of dying of torna from tornadoes and other storms is one in 2.7 million. The odds of dying from dog bites is one in 11 million. The odds of dying from gunshots is one in 514,000. The odds of dying from heart disease is one in 467 in the United States. Just trying to put a little context on this conversation. National Rifle Association, let's talk politics just for a second since you brought up the NRA. Um, why is it that NRA gets beat up so much? It ends itself in the news a lot. Well, part of it is, is because it spends so much. I mean, the NRA spends an amazing amount of money on lobbying, but it's nowhere near the biggest lobby. Uh, these are the actual contributions from NRA in the last election cycle. These are the biggest recipients from rural states uh, that have large gun ownership. I thought it'd be fun to pull up uh, members of Congress from the state of Florida to see which Congress people from Florida have gotten the most money from the NRA. Uh, this money, for example, are the biggest recipients uh, from Congress, from NRA, but if we go to Florida, and by the way, this is from OpenSecrets.org, which takes its information from the Federal Election Commission. OpenSecrets.org will show you the leading recipients of NRA, PAC, uh, NRA contributions and PACs, but even that is relatively modest compared to the biggest recipients. So our Florida Congress people um, uh, don't receive nearly as much as the biggest recipients of NRA money. Uh, in terms of who they give money to, um, uh, people on the Agriculture Commission Appropriations and Armed Services are the main recipients of NRA PAC money. So let's take a quick look at whether or not this has any influence or uh, any possible influence over how congressmen vote. In the April Senate vote on background checks, for example, the people who received contributions and voted no had received $527,000 in contributions. People who voted yes also received $68,000 in contributions. On the other hand, how much did they receive from the anti-gunners, from the, from the pro-gun control? Don't you love the vernacular we use? From the pro-gun control, how much did they give? Well, that's how much the NRA gave. <laughs> that's how much the anti-gunners gave. Um, Anti-gunners uh, give very, very little money uh, to political candidates, um, partly because they don't have a lobby to filter it through the way NRA does, but uh, it's very little money compared to the pro-gunners. 
There was a Harvard study that found states with the most gun laws have the fewest gun deaths, which seems interesting. And there are many in the gun control world who say, see, what we need are more gun control. Uh, because if we have gun control, then we'll have fewer deaths. So let's look at this map just for a second. The light colors are the states that have the least amount of gun deaths. The darker colors are the states that have the most amount of gun deaths. It would seem to argue in favor of gun control. The problem is that you can't just look at a, a, a data map like that and draw that kind of a conclusion. Why? Because as the actual authors of the studies themselves said, is it may be true there are states where People don't own a lot of guns, and of course, they're okay with passing legislation to have lower death rates from guns. So the states that had the lower gun deaths tended to be the states that had the least guns. It's not necessarily that the legislation, that the stronger control, stopped the gun deaths. You can't just draw a straight line like that. There are two data points that may or may not be associated. We can't prove that. A lot of people talk about mental illness. We need to do something about keeping the guns out of the hands of the mentally ill. New York State got involved with this. New York Times analysis of gun deaths in the United States said the following. Although people with mental illness have committed some of the most high-profile gun crimes, the mentally ill are involved in a very small percentage of violent crime. If mental illness could be removed as a source of violent crime, the crime rate would drop by 4%. Once again, we find ourselves focusing probably on the wrong thing. The fact of the matter is 96% of all rapes, robberies, and murders are committed by people who are not mentally ill, according to the FBI. They're just temporarily insane, maybe. You know, they're just mad. They've got access to a gun. They, you know. 90%, tell me if this is true. 90% of Americans and 74% of NRA members support background checks. True or false? True. OK, only one person voted. Try again. This is Florida. Vote many times. Go ahead. <laughs> true or false? True. The answer is true, according to PolitiFact. True. Yes, that is true. Um, but for those who oppose, I thought you'd find this interesting. This is Pew data, and I, I just pulled this uh, up because it's relatively new data. For those who oppose, they say their number one reason for, for opposing it is because they say, look, it's a flat out violation of the Second Amendment right. They also say that there is um, a privacy issue from the federal government. And if you look at those two numbers together, there's too much bureaucracy and they have invasion of privacy uh, problems with the federal government. You know, a few weeks ago, I might have gone, eh, I don't know about that number. That seems like it. You add those two numbers together and you start talking about the IRS uh, invasion and the uh, associated press phone records and so on, you start to understand why people are so concerned. They're able to stitch together these incidences and add that to their already existing suspicions, and these numbers grow pretty quickly. The suspicion that the federal government somehow is getting too big for its britches and we shouldn't be uh, answering to the federal government. All right, how about this one? Is it true or false? There were more murders with hammers last year than shotguns and pistols and AK-47s from Georgia Senator Bill Jackson. True, false? You'll say true? <laughs> I like you. The answer is, not only is it false, but PolitiFact called it a pants on fire lie, which is my favorite rating. Um, well, let's delve into the FBI and see what we can figure out here. There were 6,200 people killed with pistols, 300 or so killed with rifles, another 300 killed with shotguns, 496 with blunt objects, clubs, hammers, stones, and electric guitars. Sheriff, I don't know, you run into this a lot, I guess, right? Um, I don't know, why does it break it out by electric guitars? I don't understand. Um, but anyway, it turns out it's a pants on fire lie. Uh, FBI says about 800 Americans are beaten to death with fists and kicked to death each year. Um, and I heard a um, somebody on um, I heard somebody on talk radio say, you know, we're going to outlaw feet. You know, <laughs> kind of a stupid thing, but I thought it made me laugh. Um, 
CDC estimates that four people a year, by the way, are killed by hammers. Just so you'll know, they keep data on stuff like that. So they do. Um, my main message is this. There's a difference between a fact and a truth. And as consumers of news, my hope is, is that you will critically examine the information that comes your way from journalists and say, now wait a minute, what's that based on? Who said that? How do they know that? Is there any other way of looking at that? My hope is, is that you will become critical consumers. And if you really want to get smart about guns, no matter how you feel about them emotionally, if you want to get smarter about guns, go get yourself some training, get smarter about them, then you'll know what you're talking about. And then you can either more righteously oppose them or more righteously support them, but at least you'll know what you're talking about. Thanks. Good evening, and uh, thank you for allowing me to spend a few minutes and <clears throat> giving my views from a law enforcement perspective on this issue. Interesting about you know stereotypes and, and here, and I, I do agree with Dan. And I have a lot of communication with a lot of people on a daily basis on this issue. And, uh, but I do agree with him that w for those of the gun guys uh, who are, and it's consistent with the statistics uh, that you just shared, is they do think it's about them. It's not about the guns. It's about, uh, and they're concerned about, uh, especially with background checks and those kinds of things, is they think that we're coming after them as opposed to the gun issue itself. The gun issue is kind of a collateral thing to the overall issue and a distrust issue, and, and I hear that a lot. Um, also with stereotypes, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Dan said he's a Democrat, liberal, uh, Jewish guy from New Jersey who's a gun guy. Well, I'm a conservative, Republican, Catholic, originally from upstate New York, and I'm not a gun guy. Um, I carry a gun every day, and I carry a gun when I'm working, when I'm not working, because I have to. Um, I started in law enforcement 30 years ago, and I took a break in the middle of it to go to law school. I was out practicing, and during that entire period of time, I never touched a gun. Um, when I get done with my law enforcement career, we'll see. Uh, probably won't. Uh, but it's, so it's interesting how there's you know, different stereotypes that are there. Uh, but I carry one because I have to, and th that's part of the job. I think uh, on this issue, uh, it's about uh, reasonableness, I, although I'm not a gun guy per se, uh, and the only gun I have is one. It's the one I carry. I don't have 15 sitting at home, but I think that's, again, probably the stereotype. Uh, I do support the Second Amendment, and from the standpoint is I support all constitutional protections and all constitutional rights, and I think it is something uh, that we have to uh, respect, but it has to be balanced, and it has to be balanced against reasonableness and making sure that we have uh, protections in place for our society. Those that are uh, opposed uh, for Second Amendment reasons or whatever the reason that they uh, state to gun control um, miss the fact that we have significant gun control uh, in this country today. You cannot walk down the street uh, just carrying a firearm in the state of Florida. We don't have open carry. Some states do. We don't have that here in Florida. Uh, you can't carry a firearm concealed unless you have a permit. Those are all forms of gun control, all aimed at making sure that uh, we stay safe. I think we have good laws on the books. I think the laws are right. I think they're reasonable. Uh, I think we can do a better job uh, of enforcing the laws that are on the books and should do that before we consider additional uh, restrictions or controls. Uh, an example of that uh, is if you read the newspaper today, you'll see uh, that we have a gun show coming up here in Pinellas County this week. And uh, there's a county ordinance that requires background checks. And we're going to strictly uh, inf make sure that that is that it's done and we're going to strictly enforce it. Um, it hasn't been done here previously. I do support um, background, check, background checks. Uh, we have an inconsistent framework, and Dan and I were talking before uh, the program tonight uh, about that inconsistent framework with federal law, state law, and here in Pinellas County and local laws. But bottom line here in Pinellas County is, is that if you go into a gun store or if you engage in the purchase of guns in any place where the public has a right of access, is the person selling a gun, whether you're an FFL or not, federally licensed firearms dealer or not, is you have to perform a background check. And I think that that is a good thing and it's a reasonable thing to ensure that the guns don't end up in the wrong hands. 
I don't want to see, and I hope none of you want to see, the guns end up in the hands of somebody who is legally prohibited, which is a good reason, because they're a convicted felon, because they've been adjudicated mentally incompetent, or they have a domestic violence junction pending against them. I don't want to see it end up in the wrong hands and see the wrong thing happen. This isn't about target shooting. This isn't about hunting. This isn't about uh, collecting guns. This is making sure that people don't die because somebody has a motive, and that's the mechanism that they're going to use to accomplish it. I also don't want to see inconsistent results. I don't want to see a situation where we have a gun show this Saturday at Olmerton Road in US 19, and across the street there's a gun shop, and that the person says, huh, I'm not going to go into the gun shop because they're going to do a background check, and I'm a convicted felon, and I can't buy that gun. So instead, I'm going to walk across the street to the gun show, and I can buy 15 guns, and nobody's going to check. That's ludicrous to me. That's ridiculous. And as long as we have the laws on the books, we should enforce those laws. So I think that the laws, are, are again, are good. I think that we can do a better job of enforcing some of them. I think some of them can be tweaked. And here's another example of one. We have uh, a scheme in Florida uh, where it is illegal for a convicted felon to possess a firearm. It's illegal for a convicted felon uh, to possess ammunition. We have a requirement under Florida law and Pinellas County ordinance that you can't uh, buy a firearm without a background check. There is no requirement, none, that a background check has to be conducted before you can, before you can buy ammunition. We had a situation up in Oldsmar uh, last year, and there was an 18-year-old kid, and he got really, really mad at his mother and her living boyfriend. And he got mad at him. You know why? God forbid. His mother insisted he get a job, and he just wasn't going to have any of that. Is, is that he wasn't going to work? Well, most 18-year-old kids whose parents get mad at him about not getting a job, they fuss a little bit and they do certain things, and probably eventually they get the job. Not this guy. Is, is that he had had some problems with the law, and he couldn't go buy a firearm. So he got his buddy to go to the gun store down the street and bought a shotgun for him, and it was a straw purchaser situation. He couldn't buy it, and he walked in there with him, and the court said, I can't sell it to you. So he brought his buddy in, and they sold it to the buddy. He took that shotgun home, and he put it up in the crawl space of the attic of the house. And a few days later, his mother started getting on him again about uh, getting a job. And he was so mad at his mother, he didn't want to get a job when he went down to the gun store. And this time, the same gun store where he couldn't buy the shotgun, and he's got his buddy to buy it, he bought the ammunition himself. He went home, loaded the shotgun, and killed his mother and her boyfriend. And so I, I support background checks for ammunition. If we're going to have back, background checks for guns, we should have background checks for ammunition with the, with the same exemptions. Um, and so I, I think that, uh, again, we have laws on the books. I think that some of it can be tweaked a little bit to make sure that uh, we stay safe. I do not support uh, any form of gun registration. I don't think that's going to accomplish anything. I, I think if somebody wants to get their hands on a gun, uh, they're going to get their hands on the gun. And which brings to the, the whole issue uh, about gun violence. Uh, I think you don't need to look much further than Boston to see that we're going to have mass killings. We're going to have these types of incidents, and they're not all going to be tied to guns. It's not about the guns. It's about the people. Guns are one mechanism that people use to carry out an agenda. So I think we have to uh, look at it uh, from a, it's a people problem. It's not a gun problem. I do believe that. I think, again, guns are one way that people use to carry out uh, the acts uh, that they want to carry out. Um, one of the issues and questions that came up quite a bit, especially after Sandy Hook, was a reaction to what happened up there. And I got a lot of calls and questions uh, about putting uh, cops in the schools here in Pinellas County. And, and I oppose that. Um, I think that in, there are some jurisdictions that did it, and some sheriffs that did it, and some police chiefs that did it, and that's their right. Uh, and they can do what they think is the right thing in their jurisdictions. I didn't think that was the right thing here in Pinellas County. It's a knee-jerk reaction. It's a feel-good response, and doesn't really accomplish uh, what we need to. Um, and my response at the time, uh, it was you know around the holidays, and we had experienced some other things. And my response was, is that remember what happened out in Colorado? We're going to put a cop in every movie theater. Remember what happened in New York when the firemen got off the truck and they got ambushed? We're going to put cops on every uh, uh, fire truck. And remember years ago, we used to talk about people going postal, okay, because things were happening in post office. We're going to put a cop in every post office. You can't do that. It, it, you have to have a very reasoned and pragmatic response to these things, and that's what we try and do. Uh, I do support, uh, if we're going to invest in something, invest in infrastructure hardening. 
uh, make the campuses more secure, make the environment more secure, but just a feel good of putting a cop in every school and spending that kind of money, I don't support that. I also don't support open carry. Um, what may work in certain rural communities out in the West and Midwest or the Northwest, et cetera, uh, I don't support that. I'm totally opposed to that here in Pinellas County. As you know, we are the most densely populated county in the state of Florida. We have about a million people. And uh, I don't want to be in the grocery store on a Sunday night uh, with my seven-year-old daughter walking down the cereal aisle and seeing a guy with three guns strapped on his hip. I, that's not the community that I want to live in. And I think the unbridled open carry here in Pinellas County and in the state of Florida is not right for us. So I oppose uh, open carry. Um, often get questions about, from a law enforcement perspective, uh, about uh, high capacity magazines and restrictions on those. Um, my response generally is, and I'll say it here tonight, is I would need to see specifically what's being proposed. I'll give you some parameters on my thoughts on it. I think uh, restrictions on uh, magazines that carry no more than 10 rounds, it, it, that, that's too narrow. Uh, but restrictions on drums that have 100 rounds, maybe. Uh, I think that's probably too big, uh, and there's some room somewhere in the middle. So we would need to see specifically what the legislation was proposed, and then uh, you know, could give you a, a comment on it. Uh, so overall, um, uh, from a law enforcement perspective, I'd sum it up this way, is, is we got some good laws on the books. Uh, we need to vigil vigilantly enforce those laws, and we need to take a very reasoned uh, response to all of this. It shouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction, a knee-jerk response. I think we have a lot of other mechanisms that people use, and whether it, whether it's uh, explosive devices or knives or you name it, that they're going to use as well to carry out uh, what they have intended to do. We just had a situation in Indian Rocks Beach a couple days ago where a guy was in a bar. Uh, he was mad and upset, and he wanted to do harm to the person. So he went across the street. And he got a he bought from a convenience store. He bought a fillet knife and went back and stabbed him, because that was available. It's again, it's not a gun issue. It's a violence issue. It's a people issue. And if the gun was available, he probably would have shot him. The knife was available. The people in Boston with, uh, you know, the the pressure cooker bombs. They didn't use guns. So um, I think again, you know, we see this and the statistics bear it out. Is is that you know, on an annual basis, although it seems like more is we don't have that much more gun violence than, than we've ever had. And even if we have heavy restrictions of guns, you're still going to see it because if people want to do it, they are going to carry out those acts. So um, those are my thoughts, and I welcome any questions you have in a few minutes. <laughs> well, all three of you sort of talked to this idea of uh, gun guys that don't want more enforcement uh, or the background check issue. That it's a thing about uh, intrusive government or you don't trust me. We don't seem to have that issue with driver's license. Uh, I, I'm curious why you think these guns are so different. Well, part of it is because driver's licenses aren't constitutionally protected. Uh, guns have the unique support of the Second Amendment and uh, and so they, it's a right, not just a privilege. You see the difference? One is a right, one is a privilege. Now, it's not an unrestricted right, in the same way that free speech is not an unrestricted right. You can restrict speech in a lot of ways. Uh, you can uh, restrict uh, libel, and uh, if, if I defame you, obviously you'll end up uh, uh, suing me for it. Um, the old dove, uh, you know, shouting fire in the theater and all that stuff. But the fact of the matter is, is that free speech is not an unrestricted right, and neither is gun ownership. But gun ownership is a right, not a privilege. To, take, to own a gun, you don't have to take the test that you have to take, for example. Uh, you don't have to show that you, you, know, you have good eyesight or good hearing or that you can drive. You don't have to prove that you can shoot a gun to own a gun. Those are all very different when you have a privilege like a driver's license. And so there's a, a big difference. Um, other countries don't treat it that way, but we do because we have an amendment that is starkly different than the Canadians or the British or the Japanese. It's very different, and it is embedded in who we are. Whether you like it or not, the court has said very clearly in two different recent decisions, the Heller decision 
uh, and the McDonald decision in Chicago, the United States Supreme Court has been very consistent on this point. Dan, do you have anything to add about? Yeah, I think it's, you know, most gun guys I meet and talk to and that I, I'm hearing from a lot since my book came out don't really have a problem with the background checks where they, or a lot of, where they, where gun guys seem to draw the line in my experience, and I'm not a pollster, is they don't like people making consumer ch choices for them. And I think this may have to do with being consumers as much as being gun guys. They don't want to be told that we trust you with this kind of gun, but not with this. We trust you with this many rounds in your magazine, but not with this many. It galls them. And as the sheriff said, registration. They don't like the idea that the police have a list of the guns. Give but aside from that, I haven't heard much objection to the background check thing. And I think the background check thing failed in the Senate um, because by the time it came to be voted on, it was, it, was, it was tied together in the public mind with the assault rifle ban and the magazine restrictions. Frankly, I think Harry Reid did that on purpose so he could go home to Nevada and say, hey, we killed it. And, um, you know, um, and it's too bad because I think the background checks, but I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure it would have made a huge contri contribution to public safety, but it would have made people feel good and it probably would have done some good. And why do you think, uh, if the public is behind background checks, why has that, why does the NRA continue to succeed in thwarting it? You know, I, I think the press, and I, even, and the liberal press especially, like the editorial board, I think the editorial board of the New York Times is the best friend the NRA has. The NRA, uh, as Al pointed out, is not a particularly large lobby. It gives half as much money to members of Congress as the pipe fitters union. And I don't remember the members of Congress genuflecting before the pipe fitters any time recently. But we have seen here in Florida, the NRA has an amazing grassroots network. Yeah, but you know, the NRA, to put the NRA on doesn't have, the NRA has as many members as the Wilderness Society. Gun laws are the way they are because that's the way Americans want them. And, and members of Congress vote the way the NRA wants because members of Congress are from places like Kentucky and Wyoming and Texas and those, so that, that's how they feel about this issue. So, so you think the loss in the Senate was more about the packaging of the, of the measure? Yeah, I think the Democrats chose the wrong fight, played it badly, and got creamed. I would say and are unwilling to learn from it, apparently. You know, I would say don't, don't group all gun owners as NRA members. They're, 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 not. they're a subset. Uh, NRA members are a subset of gun owners, but, but it's not the universe, not by a long shot. No, they have four million members. Well, <laughs> I mean, you, you're a politician. You have well, you have well, you, you it, hear from the NRA. Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, and a lot a lot of politicians are afraid of them. Uh, a lot of politicians don't want to buck them. Um, you, you know, and I didn't get an A rating from them um, originally in the last election cycle, and um, you know, but that's a lot of it is they don't want to buck them uh, because it's for political reasons. And and when you get that magazine that comes out and the endorsements come out. When I didn't get endorsed by the NRA in the last election cycle, I, I had tons of people coming up to me, and it, it, it sparked all kinds of questions, and they didn't know whether they could vote for me. So it, it, it posed some problems. Obviously, not you know too many problems because I won handily, but um, it, it, it's a problem. It's a political problem, and I think what it comes down to is is that politicians are afraid of bucking them. But I also agree with with, with this in what was alluded to is there are the gun guys. And then there's the gun guys. And there's a big difference, is, is that not everybody's a, a, quote, NRA person. There's people who are NRA people and NRA members that are, are gun enthusiasts. It's the people that are over here. It's those people who I was alluding to, who I have contact with, who either Facebook me or whatever on social media and get inundated with, that it's not really about the guns. The guns are a symbol of their problem with the federal government, their problem with government in general. And, and I believe that if it wasn't the guns that was the symbol for them, it would be something else. These are the people who routinely would ask me and still ask me, when the federal government comes into Pinellas County and they're going door to door and taking our guns, are you going to stand up to the federal government? You know, and, and to, me, to me, frankly, that's a ridiculous question because it's not going to happen. And they say, well, it's not, it's not a hypothetical because of what happened in New Orleans. This isn't New Orleans. And it, it, that was an anomaly situation over there. And, uh, as I said many times, no, I'm not going to put Pinellas County deputy sheriffs on the peak of the Howard Franklin Bridge and engage in a firefight with the Army as they're coming across the bridge. That's stupid. So, um, 
know, but but that's the kind that's the type of questions we get, and, and that, those are the people that are over here. They're not the gun guys who are gun enthusiasts, enthusiasts who like to shoot and hunt and even may have large gun collections. That's a great thing, but it's it's those that are over here in my view. You know, Dan, in your book, you you went and met the NRA, the, the the two educators at the NRA. I think right. you said. Yeah. Um, and you and you made a, I can't remember the number, but you made a comparison. Uh, you know, the NRA that you were recalling from your youth who trained. You know, it was all about getting your badge that you knew how to handle a firearm safety safely. That that NRA is now five guys. A, five guys out the of the education and training department. And the and the lobbying. I mean, the political hundreds, side. Hundreds. Is, hundreds. Hundreds. Um, uh, I think almost everyone would want the NRA to do more of what these five guys do. I mean, well, maybe we would, maybe we wouldn't. I mean, um, this is told in the book, but you know, the NRA has a program called Eddie Eagle that they offer to schools, and it um, teaches children what to do if they find a firearm. The, this, this guy I met from the NRA in the education and training program, he went to an NEA, National Education Association, conference and set up a booth and was offering Eddie Eagle to schools. Now, Eddie Eagle is not a perfect program. It's not particularly sophisticated. It teaches kids to do four things if they find a gun. Stop, don't touch, leave the area, tell an adult, okay? Um, the, the, the teachers at this conference wouldn't listen to the NRA. I actually wanted them to leave. And I have spoken to teachers, friends of mine who are teachers, and I said, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about teaching in school what to do if a child finds a gun? And they say, oh, I don't want that. I don't want kids getting all excited about guns. I don't want to talk about guns in my classroom and get kids all excited about guns. And it sounds to me like fundamentalist Christians saying, I don't want to teach sex ed in school because it's going to get kids all excited about sex. Um, the country is full of guns. The country is saturated in guns. That's already happened. Um, so to me, it seems to make sense to teach children what you do if you come across a gun. Kids go to, kids to, to their friends' houses, they go to their uncle's house, and they find guns, in part because we gun guys are such lousy custodians of our guns. We keep them lying around, uh, unprotected. So I think it makes sense. Um, but there is a... Um, there is on the part of the anti-gun community a desire to kind of pretend that that is not true. And instead of confronting the problem that exists, there is this tendency to focus on what guns people might be able to buy in the future. And not only don't I think that that really makes us safer, but I think it makes us less safe because it alienates gun guys when we should be trying to bring them in. Well, there's one school of thought that this whole conversation is going to be mute in 10 to 15 to 20 years. When, yeah, th when, when 3D printers are uh, inexpensive and people will be able to manufacture their Actually, own guns. Actually, this, this, whole, this whole debate is going to be moot in about 10 or 20 years because of the statistics that Al showed. And when I talk about this to gun guys, they go ballistic. But the fact is young people have very little interest in firearms. Young people want to be urban and digital, and guns are neither. And if you look at the statistics, people in their 20s are a tiny percentage of the gun buying public. There will always be people in America who want to own guns, but you ask young people, 20-somethings, about guns, they're not interested. They're frankly not interested in automobiles either. And the, and the automobile industry is really bent out of shape about this and trying to figure out how to get young people interested in cars. But the gun industry, I mean, this whole gun debate may in 25 years look as archaic as arguing about temperance or whether women should be allowed to vote because gun culture is going away. I want to get one question into the sheriff before we open this up. F Florida's seen an extraordinary explosion in the number of people getting concealed weapons permits. Uh, who has a concealed weapons permit now in Florida is uh, secret. You and I can't go find out if our neighbor has a concealed weapon permit. I guess I'm wondering how that may have changed. What, what, what has that changed for policing? And what do you, what's the fallout, do you think, as someone who's, I mean, you can find out who has a concealed weapon permit, but. You know, and for us, um, 
it, it, it doesn't matter because we do know and, and mm -hmm. we, we can tell because we know when we run somebody in the computer system that all the deputies have access to in the cars immediately. And if they're doing a traffic stop um, and they run the tag and they run the person, they know when they you know, walk up to the car whether the person has a concealed carry permit or not. Um, so for us, I think the, the impact is minimal, but of course where that comes and, and, from. And I'm it, curious, it, is that deputy ask right away? Or are you, do you have your weapon on you? Or? Usually, but, but most of the time, and again, majority of the people, the absolute majority of the people, and I'd say that anybody that's got a concealed carry permit are not the kind of people we're concerned about. It's the, the people who don't have the concealed carry permit, who got it illegally, bought it on the street, et cetera. Those are the people that you, so, you know, if I do a traffic stop, I'm more concerned, you know, with an unknown situation. If I know they're a concealed carry uh, uh, person and they have a permit, um, generally, those people are going to be law-abiding people. And they've had better tra they've had and, training. And they've had some sort of training, but most of them will tell you up front. Usually, when you walk up, uh, the first thing they'll say to you is, "I have a gun in the car," etc. Now, sometimes, and depends on the circumstances, is we have people will get called to a disturbance, will get called to a certain situation, uh, and the person will say, "Hey, I have a permit, and I'm, you know, I have a gun on me." And if it's a situation, it, it probably will subject them to. Uh, being searched and, and being, uh, it depends upon what it is, a fight or something like that. So it may be a little bit more inconvenient for them because we want to make sure that a, a volatile situation doesn't become worse. So I, I think that um, uh, sometimes it might be a little bit more inconvenient for them. But Can you know, I ask us, a quick question about not, that? Not a, big, not a big problem. Sheriff, how often does it happen that a person with a concealed carry permit is involved in a gun crime? I mean, rarely. Rarely. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't tell you, you know, the last time. I can tell you all the times uh, that we have encountered that and that I can think of recently, and I don't know of anybody that has a concealed I, In all my years as, yeah. as a journalist, I've been a journalist for close to 40 years. I've never covered a crime. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm, I've never covered a crime with a person who has a legal concealed carry permit who killed somebody in, yeah. you know, in a bar I, fight or I something I have. Like. I mean, just yeah. a... Yeah. The yeah. Violence no, Policy it's Center came up with, with about yeah. 700, mm -hmm. yeah. 700 people yeah. in the last 20 years 20 in a country yeah. with, with 7 million but, concealed And I have problems. never heard of a yeah. legally registered but machine gun being used. How many of those are domestics, though? Right. right. That, you know, a lot right. of it is known crime. You, you know, what we're all concerned, really concerned about, you, I can't stop domestics. You can't stop that. Uh, per, it's the unknown crime. That's the greatest concern. And I guess Dan, Dan talked, I mean, uh, Dan has a CCW, as they're called. I and, do. And uh, you talked a lot in your book about how that changes your mindset when you're out. The code yellow, I think, or I can't right. remember. What, now, I, uh, you know, I don't carry a gun for a living. I haven't been carrying a gun for years. I carried for about a year and a half. Um, but I can tell you that when, when you're carrying, I became, and the other gun carriers tell me, really aware of what's going on around me. And you become Mr. Nice. I describe a, a, um, a situation in New Orleans. I mean, if, gun, if legal gun carriers are, are not involved in crimes, maybe it's because, what happens is, I was in New Orleans one night, and I was walking along, and some panhandlers asked me for money, and I didn't give them any money, and as I walked by, they called me a faggot. Now, I don't really care, but if I hadn't been wearing my gun, I might have said something back, or I might have, um, I don't know, I might have made a joke back, I might have said something back, at least I, would have, I might have been irritated. But because I was wearing my gun, I just kind of knew I can't afford to get involved at all. Should gun permits be public record? No. That would why, be a, why that, not? It's a, it is really unsafe. What, what they teach you in your concealed carry class, if it's a good one, is concealed means concealed. You don't show people your gun, you don't tell people you're carrying a gun, you don't want people knowing who's got a gun. You don't put a sticker on your car that says keep, keep honking. How do I, as a journalist, know whether or not the state is doing a good job of permitting people who are not criminals uh, and certified nutcases if I can't see the records? Well, or or, or that they're being revoked when appropriate. What does it, how does having the names, certainly, pu and publishing the names is really dangerous. Well, I didn't say publish it. I, I'm just, so you want I'm, journalists to know stuff that they don't publish? Well, no, the oh, we public. we do all the time. No, the public. <laughs> but I don't just want journalists to know because I don't want journalists to have any rights that everybody else doesn't have. Okay. I don't understand why we permit and then close the permits. 
because it is Either unsafe. Either permit it and make it open record or don't permit it at all, but to permit it and only make the government the only keeper and the only arbiter well, doesn't make any sense to me any more than it makes sense to have a driver's way, license you could, or a doctor's license or any other kind of or, license. And does it not play into the gun guy mentality of, of why is the government the only one that knows things? To me, though, letting people know who's letting the public know who has guns and who doesn't is an invitation to burglary, is an invitation to robbery. Putting a sign on your house that says this house protected by Smith and Wesson is stupid, and because that tells people there's a gun in there. I, I sympathize with that, but as a matter of policy, it seems to me that if we in Florida, of all places, where we have the strongest open records laws in the country. As a matter of policy, it seems to me to be difficult to put together that we have a database and then close it so that nobody can examine whether or not we're doing well, what the database is supposed so to do. So are mental health records. Well, mental health records are protected uh, in a number of ways, not the least of which are federal laws that... Uh, that uh, uh, medical records. Uh, medical records. Uh, but even, even those have leaks, as you know. The issue with, medical, with, with mental health records is this argument that if we require doctors to uh, disclose that somebody's on antidepressants or something, that they'll just not go get treatment. Well, let's ask an expert. Yeah. Sheriff, do you think it would make us safer to have to well, that's, well, that's not, that's not Dan, my question. Dan's, Dan's, not not aware, question. Dan's not aware of this, but they, they were open until about three years ago. When it was they published were, by a published. newspaper and in reaction. No, uh, I, I, here in Florida, was it published? Yeah, uh, and uh, the same thing happened in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Same thing's going to happen in New York, where the uh, news journal stupidly reported uh, people's gun ownership in the newspaper. Um, uh, you know, I think that as a matter, I mean, as I support open records, and I am uncomfortable having open having public records that are not open unless there is a very good reason. Um, but I am not supporting the open publishing and reporting of those records any more than I think there's any reason to publish all of your property records or or Would or you forbid the, the publication? I would not forbid them, but you can't because that's prior restraint okay. and it's against the Constitution. Okay. That's the uh, first amendment. Let's, let's get the sheriff's thoughts on this and then we're going to open it to uh, y'all's questions. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to pass me over on that one. <laughs> <laughs> As a journalist, I can't. I Sorry. know. I, I, I know. <laughs> You know, it, it's a tough one for me because I do have access to the information. Um, I, and I'll say the, and I've asked a lot of people this question who are adamantly opposed to it. And it generally comes down to that I don't want anybody knowing uh, because I don't want anybody coming to get my gun. Um, and the question, uh, Danny asked, do, do I think that we are would any less safe because it's not public or we would be more safe uh, if it was public, no, I don't think so. I don't think that that has a bearing on it whatsoever. Um, I, I think there's an interesting interplay there between broad public records and access. Um, and it also comes back to that issue of, uh, in I think, Al, what you're talking about there a little bit, is in, in journalists certainly have a role uh, and a check and balance role as far as the government's concerned, but I'm hearing a little bit of distrust of the government. And maybe what we're hearing lately with some of the stuff out of Washington, there should be. Um, but, you know, so... It's a, it's a tough one. I don't think it affects public safety because we have access to it. If we didn't have access to it, it would be a different story. Assu so. Assuming that yeah. uh, you have honest people in law enforcement. Well, I right. Mean that, I mean, that, right. that, that's and about, you know, that's sure. always what democracy sure. is a little bit about. Absolutely. Is that the, the citizenry can check their government. So. Sure. No, and I understand that. And, you know, and, and certainly uh, nobody's perfect and no system's perfect. And so there, it's good to have checks and balances. Well, we have disagreement but. on the panel. So uh, this gentleman uh, raised his hand. If you could uh, introduce yourself before you ask your question. My, my question is this. All right. I look at it from a standpoint of, I became very emotionally involved when I saw the little great grandkids get, I got grandkids, they get mowed down by someone that is mentally in, uh, incompetent. The last one before that was mentally incompetent. So, so my problem is not with gun control, it's with people control. Mm -hmm. And it's, I want to protect my children, okay, and my grandchildren as a United States citizen. I have a right to also expect the government to serve and protect me. A background check wouldn't have prevented that. Though. Agreed. Now, going back to the, to, the, to the government and the system that we have, this is not about NRA. This is not about Republicans or Democrats. This is not about anything of that nature, although it was made to be. I'm tired of it. So what I want to say is this. 
this is really a simple solution, and it's one I would like to, to propose, is that there's nothing wrong with having a license like getting a car driving, driving license. Doesn't mean you own a gun, but you're competent enough to operate a car, you're competent enough to operate a gun. So if you just use that, it doesn't violate my constitutional right, because hey, you know, I don't necessarily have to have a gun if I have a license, but at least if so, I want so to, I can go get it. Can we get a question? So. Yeah. Say it again? Would you like a, qu a question? Do you the have a question, question is, to one of them? What's wrong with that? You mentioned yeah. your driver's license. You mentioned that, that well, idea. Well, the, 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 I think what you're, what you're suggesting, and again, I am not a lawyer, but right. as uh, there are lawyers in the room, um, <laughs> what, I, what I think you're suggesting is some sort of competency test to be able to own a gun, and I don't think that would even come close to passing well, constitutional you, muster. You, you may be interested, I believe the Florida legislature this session is, Mr. Ahern's here, and uh, passed a, a law that did, act, I mean, we actually passed a gun control law that adds to the people who cannot, who would be caught in a background check, those who voluntarily admitted themselves to a mental institution at one point. My, my um, question actually, Julian, what's wrong, what's wrong with that? Well, and I think his point, uh, yeah. what, what he said earlier is that it, it's, it's a right versus, uh, driving you know, is not a right. Driving you know, one, is of, a one of the things that I've, the right. I'm saying you, have a right you know, one of, the, one of the things that I heard um, a, 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 a violence advocate suggest is rather than legislating it, um, one, of the, uh, one of the suggestions that's going around uh, in the common sense gun laws groups is to work with insurance companies to jack up insurance rates for people who are gun owners so or, that or if- Or require a policy. Yeah. Or require a gun policy. Look, I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know if it works. I don't know anything, but I can tell you that conversation is going on to make it, in other words, it would be a, it would be very restrictive gun control. What can you legislate? You can legislate, I suppose you can legislate insurance companies. We regulate insurance companies. So what often happens is, is when you want to shut something down, government starts figuring out, okay, well, what do we control that does something about that? The transportation department knows that every time it wants to do something about your speed limits. It says, we can't tell you how fast to drive, but we can tell you you're not going to gain road funds if you drive over 70 or whatever. So what happens is, is they start ch you know, chunking down those things that they have power there's, there's over. There's consequences, yeah. And, and this is a conversation that's going on. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere, but it is a conversation that's going on. Thank you. Uh, another question? Don't be shy. Yes, sir, please uh, identify yourself. <laughs> she won't let me hold the mic. <laughs> My name is Arthur Hayhoe. I'm the executive director of the Florida Coalition to Stand Gun Violence. In other words, I run the state's gun control organization, and I have for 30 years. I've been through all of this, and I don't think in my group see anything funny about gun violence. And my question is for Dan Baum. Do you know how many kids you're going to kill by recommending the NRA's Eddie Eagle program? There's been two state universities that extensive study on that, that thing, which be, you know, creates a false sense of, of security among, among uh, uh, parents to allow them to use guns because they went through these uh, things where they put guns out and every time the kids go directly to them. Marion Hammer got thrown out of, of various schools in the state. By the way, Eddie Eagle was devised as a way to uh, try to defeat the, uh, the uh, firearm preemption law, not the firearm preemption law, but the law against leaving guns around uh, the children could find. She used that to try to kill that, but it didn't work. But the question is, Dan, have you ever reviewed these studies? I have, and I agree with you. Eddie Eagle is not perfect, but, and, and, but I, I think that the I think that rejecting gun education for children is a mistake because I think guns are out there, they're part of society. None of us wants to see kids get their hands on guns. And I think teaching children one way or the other what to do if you find a gun is a good idea. We may disagree. And, disagree. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Another question? Back here in the back. I had no idea Eddie Eagle was so controversial. I, 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 Eddie Eagle was, I mean, when I was, uh, Eddie Eagle uh, teaches kids to leave guns on the playground. Uh, 
And for people sort of our age, we always went through the Daisy BB gun training. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if they still do that or not, but I mean, oh that's what we used to do is go to the Daisy BB gun training and learn how to shoot that kind of stuff. So I don't, if I was a journalist, I'd be something? investigating Eddie Eagle today. I think yeah. that's really interesting. Hi, my name's Anthony, and uh, my question is directed towards a sheriff. I have a background in corrections, but um, my question is not so much on the adult side of violence with weapons, because like you said, adults' violence, that's going to happen no matter what. Whatever's around them, is gonna, that's what they'll use. Um, my question is more of what programs is our county going to instill, attempting to instill, such as the Explorer program, that teaches uh, young minds, students that are getting into their early teens on proper weapons handling. For example, in Texas, there was a young girl who had a home invasion. She was home alone, 12 years old, and she was able to hide in a closet, and she actually shot the intruder. And when law enforcement came, she unloaded the weapon, unchambered the round that was still in there, and did everything perfect, but that was based on all of her family teaching her, whereas a lot of the Pinellas County families, especially in the low income part of our county doesn't have that ability to be able to teach our children that. Well, I, I, I think that it's got to come from the family. Uh, I think that's a personal decision uh, that everybody has to make. It, 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 it wouldn't go over well, um, I don't think, in this county if the government got in the business of trying to uh, instill gun safety classes or even require somehow or even encourage, you know, parents got to make that choice and make that decision. If they're, if they're going to have guns in their house, then they should be very clear with the kids and take away the curiosity and teach them and train them in so that they don't have accidents and don't have problems. But, but I think that's a personal decision uh, that an individual has to make as it relates to their kids and how they want to handle it. And hopefully they do it in a responsible way. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's something the government should get involved in as far as that, that decision with the kids. And there's ways. I mean, if parents want to have... Uh, gun safety classes for their kids, and if they really want to do it, they, they, can, get, they, they can find them. They're out there. Uh, you know, I think that what you say, though, is so yeah. important. Yeah. Um, my son, who's 15 now, and he was about 13, um, he started playing, and he loves playing video games. He's a great kid. He's a great student, all that. But he, plays, he plays video games that are first-person shooting games, and he really loves them, and I see why. They're a lot of fun. I mean, I, they are in a crazy way. They're very interesting. Um, but I said, you know what, if you're going to play that, then we're going to go do something about that. We're going to go to a gun range, and I want you to actually shoot a real gun, and I want you to see the velocity and the magnitude and the damage, and I want you to see what really happens, because you don't regenerate, you know, once you shoot somebody. Um, and so we did that. We went down to Knight Sporting Goods, and, uh, and, and, and we went several times. And we hired a guy to train him uh, to, uh, to shoot two or three different kinds of guns, and he really liked it, and he never really wanted to go back. We shot two or three times. He's never asked me again to go back. But he was extraordinarily curious before we went. I think, that's, I think it's an important thing that we do as parents. If you're going to allow your kids to play first-person shooting games, I think we owe it to them and owe it to our community, owe it to each other to make sure they understand what they're playing with. This gentleman right here. I'm Rodell Fields. Uh, this question is for any of you. You are a concealed permitted to carry. You're in a supermarket, and suddenly some guy pops up with a, with a handgun, and he's got the clerk stuck up at the checkout counter. My question to you is a matter of discretion. If you shoot at him, and you miss him and hit a patron, what are your legal outcomes? <laughs> You're in big trouble. <laughs> you might be in big trouble if you shoot the robber and hit him. <laughs> right, right. Sure. Sheriff? Yeah, no, you can have problems there. It comes down to negligence. I mean, it's, it, it depends upon how you acted. You're probably going to get sued over it, and it depends upon, you know, whether, uh, you, you know, once you took that action, you had under the law what's called a duty, and it depends whether you breached that duty and whether you acted negligently. It depends upon how you did it and what you did it. We get litigated in the civil courts, and most likely, 
you know, you're probably gonna, you're gonna have a problem, but it, but it's a, it would be a civil case and it would be a negligent standard and that's how it would if be I, If I can just add something there. The carrying a gun is a big damn deal and the, the training requirements in most states are a joke and I think that's appalling. I actually support concealed carry. I think concealed carry is fine, but I think, I think people who want to carry a gun should be trained at least as well as the sheriff's deputies and, and have to requalify every six months. I think it's a big deal to carry a gun. Um, and this is one of my causes. I mean, it, what, what I was taught, I, find, I had bad training in Colorado uh, to get my permit, and then I went and got good training. And what I was taught was the only way to win a gunfight is not to be there when it happens. And what you do, the best thing to do is run away. I am not a law enforcement officer. If I saw that happening, I would probably just say, the best thing I can do is be a great witness because I am not well trained enough to shoot it out with somebody. So, but not everybody is well trained. If I can share, Dan in his book talks about that good training he got and he yeah. talks about that his instructor consistently said to him, you have to be prepared for who you're shooting behind the target. Oh, yeah. Because you, I mean, you're, you might yeah, miss. Right. And, and what happens in a gunfight is you get tunnel vision, and all you can see is the guy you want to shoot, and you're not seeing the three-year-old behind him. Um, yes. We are, most of us are not nearly well-trained enough Ted, to be Ted, in your training, guns. what would you say to somebody in a circumstance like that? Ted, I'm sorry. The guy sitting right there in the black there uh, does, actually does training. What would you say to somebody in a circumstance like that, in your training, Ted? We, we try to teach avoidance if, if at all possible. You know, you're not a law enforcement officer, right? So you got to be. You have to use discretion, you know, and because right. you're responsible for everything that comes out of that gun. Hmm. Yeah. And, and the sheriff was going to. Well, and, and that's why it came. It comes up, and it came up this year about having teachers in schools carrying guns. And I'm totally opposed to that. I think that's just a tragedy waiting to happen. So I mean, it, it's it, it, it would cause more problems uh, than it would solve. It, and, and a lot of it's for that reason, as you mentioned, sir, because uh, they're not trained, and I don't care if they go and going to qualify. Every six months isn't even enough. Right. I mean, you need to have, and it's and it's about tactical training, and it's not about shooting at a target. You want to feel like you want to know what it's going to feel like in that high stress situation. Run around this building four times, do about a hundred push-ups, and then try and hit the target. And, and that's what we do. That's how we train because you got to simulate that. So um, it, it would be a horrific situation, and, and that's why teachers shouldn't have guns. A hostage was killed by a police officer. Yep. Right. Okay. So this 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 yep. raises the question right. of, sure. of carrying and discretion. Right. I'm I'm with you. I was scared to death carrying. I was glad to be done with it. Frankly, I carried it for the purposes of my book, and then I, I was done with it. Um, but that's a personal decision. Yeah. Tell us your name, sir. Yes. The U.S. was formed after the American Revolution, after the Articles of Confederation by the adoption of a constitution. Mm -hmm. That constitution did not get approved until the Bill of Rights was added, which included these amendments. Mm -hmm. Not only the Second Amendment, but also the First Amendment. They all stand as a, as a bulwark for our freedom. I don't think that we should be, I, I think that we should be extremely careful in tampering with anything that affects those basic amendments. I, the news today was that a member of the administration would invoke the Fifth Amendment in testifying before a congressional committee. I support that right to invoke that commitment if she so desires. And when you start to tinker with the in, individual amendments, I think we're headed for extreme difficulty. Thank you. The, the court has been very clear on this uh, over over 100 years. Uh, the court has no appetite for doing something about watering down the Second Amendment. Hi, my name's Barbara Stiers, and I'm here tonight because I know nothing about guns. And I have a question that sounds simplistic, but it seems to me that if you wanted to carry a gun legally, you would want it to protect yourself. And you're saying to, to Dell, 
if you try to protect someone, you're in a lot of trouble. What have I missed here? It changes your world to wear a gun. It makes you really careful. It makes you really vigilant. It makes you a little bit, I don't know, maybe, you know, you, you find yourself not sitting with your back to the door. You find yourself kind of walking into a room and kind of checking it out. Some people really like that. I kind of liked it at first, and I eventually burned out on it because it just, it was just too much all the time. You put the gun on and suddenly you're, they call it condition yellow. You're just, a, you're just super vigilant. Um, some people like it. What happens to you is, like, it makes your whole life much more together. You're never leaving your sunglasses on a, on a, on a counter or leaving your credit card in a store because you're like, you really have your stuff together when you're wearing a gun. I, I, would, I would like to think you could do that without the gun. I want to add um, the sheriff here. Just, just quickly so we make sure we're not misconveying to you the situation. And the situation that I was really answering is more of this. So if somebody's in the store, and remember, it's, it's all about negligence. It's all about duty. And with the Florida Stand Your Ground law, it gives people certain rights. You don't have to retreat like you used to, et cetera. If, if somebody is, um, has a gun, you're pointing a gun at me, and you're a threat to me, and I shoot. And when I shoot, let's say the bullet goes over your shoulder and strikes the man behind you. That's a totally different situation then I'm in the serial R, I pull out the gun, here's where the threat is, but I shoot him over here, okay? So it isn't, it, there's no automatics. It's gonna be analyzed depending upon the facts, and did you use due care as a reasonable person would under those circumstances? I guess my other question would, would be, as a sense of community and caring for our fellow citizens, sure. you know, if someone was holding a gun on me, he had, you know, in the grocery store, and shot, it seems to me that that's reasonable for no. but, but other You hope he's a good shot. <laughs> I, can tell you, I can tell you that when the, when the shooting happened in Aurora, which happened about an hour away from me, my first thought was, I wish I had been there with my gun. I wish I had been in the theater and had my gun. I would have shot at him. I would have shot at him. And I think in a just, dark theater, yeah, with a movie still going and people screaming everywhere. I think right. that's a pretty risky shot. Well, it is, <laughs> but the people who are, but that's a mass shooting situation. That's not a robbery. Right. In a robbery, the guy might take the money and run. So, right? But if somebody's shooting, he's already announced he's trying to kill as many people as he can. To me, there's nothing worse than one person in a room full of unarmed people. That's why gun guys see um, gun-free zone stickers, right? The little sticker on the door with a picture of a gun with a slash through it. This is a gun-free zone. To gun guys, that is announcing, you want to kill a lot of people? Come here. Because you can be sure there will be no law-abiding person in here with a gun who can fight back. And so it's a different perspective. Some people are very comforted by, oh, this is a gun-free zone. I can be sure nobody will have a gun here. But the idea that somebody bent on mass murder is going to be dissuaded by a sticker on the door to gun guys seems delusional. I'm sorry, we have time for just one more question. Uh, do you still, yeah, is it? Okay. More women. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, um, I'll, my name is Glenn Gilzine, and I'll make it quick. But uh, we touched on, I think, three or four questions ago regarding low income um, communities. Uh, I get, I'm, all, I'm fortunate that I have the chance to travel the state and work in, uh, in key communities like Miami-Dade, Duval, here. And, but when I turn on the news like WSVN down in Miami-Dade and you see something regarding gun violence, it's always in African-American communities or low-income minority communities. And I think that's something that we haven't touched on or we kind of, and you kind of danced around it. But how do we resolve that issue? Because ultimately, when I was on the school board, I've always said it was a tale of two school districts. You had the North County and you had the South County. And then mm -hmm. you, can, you can take that however you want to take that. But when we talked about some of the issues today regarding uh, guns and parents can take their children out and have that training, well, how does that work for someone in South County who has a family or a mom or dad who's not there, who's working multiple jobs, who can't do that? So how do we, we resolve those issues? We haven't begun talking about class and race in this country. We are, I wrote a book about the drug war 20 years ago, and it's the same kind of thing. I mean, the idea that we can, the last group of Americans who are still killing each other 
in large numbers are young African American men, right? And the idea that we can, you know, we look at the totality of the lives that they live, and the idea that we are going to, that, that the fix is to pass gun laws, to me is whack. I mean, you know, we need to talk about, we need to talk about the lives these men live and why we have poor people, and why, you know, why we still have institutional racism. I mean, and those are big, hard conversations to have. And so what we do instead is, is say, oh, let's criminalize the drugs they choose to use, and let's criminalize the guns they choose to use, and that'll fix it. So I, 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 think it's, I, I think it's avoidance. I think this is one of those really interesting, um, really interesting things that um, I, was on a, um, I was on a panel of maybe a couple of months ago and uh, there was a guy there uh, who said, let me just, and he was, he was, by the way, the person who financed the Heller decision uh, in D.C., the, num the, the Opus um, Second Amendment uh, U.S. Supreme Court case. And he said, here's the thing, and I'm not advocating this, but I'm just telling you, he said, if you want to do something about gun violence, decriminalize drugs. Uh, you know, my heart sank, and I thought, oh, my goodness, I don't know about this. Maybe the guy's just, maybe he's just provoking us. And he said, no, let me just say, he said, he said the crime that we are talking about um, is drug crime. You take the profit out of drugs. He went back to prohibition. He was making the whole argument about take the profit out of the drugs. You take the, the violence out of the drug market and so on. It's a provocative idea, just as as prohibition and the repeal of prohibition was a provocative idea. I get it, it's provocative. It's not an easy conversation, but it's one that's worth talking about. Just to say, does this make any sense? Would it cause more problems than it cures? I don't know those answers, and neither do you. What I would say is, if we're serious about finding a solution, to gun violence. Let's talk about what causes, as Dan says, let's talk about what causes the gun violence. Oh, and how we can make young African American men feel welcome and valued in this society. I mean, you know, we got a lot of work to do in this country. And frankly, I think even the drug debate, certainly the gun debate, is often used to avoid. You know, across the country, there is a relaxation of marijuana laws that I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have guessed. 15, 20 years ago, would have ever been, it's legal in my state. you know, but, you know, in Colorado, in Washington, in California, and so on, um, you know, you think the sheriff is busy now, wait till he has medical um, uh, marijuana pharmaceutical uh, places to start uh, policing. I mean, it's going to make, it's going to make those bingo parlors look like nothing, man. Um, uh, but Internet I mean, it's coming, cafes. it's coming. That conversation <laughs> is coming. I don't know when it's coming. But it's coming. It's starting with marijuana, and it's moving. Do you have anything to add? No, the only thing I would say, Glenn, is that a lot of the, not all, and not all, but disproportionately, a lot of, the, and one of the things that I don't think was said tonight, uh, there are no illegal guns. No guns are illegal. Guns are in people's hands who illegally possess them. And I think we see a lot, especially in the, in the lower socioeconomic areas, for reasons that you know, and, and there's a higher crime, for all these reasons that are hard discussions. I, th I think a lot of the guns we see in those areas are uh, guns that are in people's hands illegally. Um, I, I, I think if you took a look, you'd see that uh, a lot of them shouldn't have guns to begin with. So if they shouldn't have the guns to begin with, then you're not going to see that in the responsibility and the teaching and those kinds of things. So it, it, it's, a, it's a bigger problem, uh, a broader problem. So I think that it gets back to the question before, what are we going to do to teach, be able to teach these kids, let's say, in those lower socioeconomic, I think the parents have to do it. But a lot of the people, a lot of those parents, is they shouldn't have the guns to begin with. And a lot of those parents are uh, illegally in possession, possession of those guns because they're convicted felons or for a variety of reasons. I, th I think that's a reality. And, and, and then you probably also have those who legally have guns, but they feel like they need the guns because they live in neighborhoods right. where there's a and, lot of and, violence. And they don't even have permits. I mean, a lot of this, not, they're not permitted. They, you don't need a permit to own a gun just to carry a concealed. So. Well, thank everyone very much. <laughs>